yeah good morning everyone if we can begin with a word of prayer uh, we'll start the class if anyone could pray father we thank you for this wonderful morning lord we come before you in the mighty name of jesus lord we i here to learn from your word my father god give us wisdom knowledge to know about know about you more and lord not only listening class lord but let uh, help us to apply the all thing in our life also my father i surrender our mem into your hands my father god thank you for her life thank you for everything in the mighty name of jesus we uh, pray amen 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 thank you so um last week we focused on john chapter 3 we looked at the importance of being born from above uh, that was the main focus and uh, now we are moving into john chapters 4 and 5 so uh, we will not be able to cover every single verse um, so we will cover whatever we can at least the main highlights um, so that nothing important is missed out uh, last class we also looked at the introduction to chapter 4 in the sense we talked about who the samaritans are uh, what their background was and why there was this strong enmity between the samaritans and the jewish people so we already uh, looked at the basic introduction so um, having understood the animosity which was there between these two communities now we you know we'll have a better understanding of what is going on in in this account um so if we could have someone read out for us uh, john chapter 4 uh, up to verse 6 you know which will be like a revision of what we talked about last week so if uh, john chapter 4 verses 1 to 6 if someone could read out the jesus made and baptized more disciple uh, disciples than john though jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples he left judea and departed again to galilee but he needed to go through samaria so he came to a city of samaria which is called by uh, called saicha saica near the plot of ground the that jacob gave to his son joseph now jacob's well was there jesus therefore being wearied from his journey set us by the well it was about 6 hour yeah so we've already looked at these verses uh, last week uh, but just as a reminder verse 4 where it says now he had to go through samaria and we pointed out the fact that it was not really necessary for him to have to go through samaria uh, rather he was doing this because he felt an urging of the holy spirit inside He, he felt led to do this so that is why he had to go not geographically speaking because geographically he is speaking he was closer to the jordan so it would have been very very easy to take the road which uh, lies along the uh, you know alongside the river so he could have avoided going through samaria but because of the urging of the holy spirit which he must have felt inside he felt he had to go through this particular territory and that is how he ends up encountering the samaritan woman so having understood this background um if we could just read out maybe the next three uh, next four verses yeah um verse 7 to verse 10 if someone could read out yeah. uh, verse 7 a woman of samaria came to draw water jesus said to her give me a drink for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food then the woman of samaria said to him how is it that you being a jew ask a drink from me a samaritan woman for jews have no dealings with samaritans jesus answered and said to her if you knew the gift of god and who it is who says to you give me a drink you would have asked him and he would have given you living water so uh, the lady comes over here to draw water and jesus is actually sitting at the well because he is tired and he asks her for a drink of water and this takes her by surprise because the jews have such a low opinion of uh, the samaritans that they will definitely not 
touch any water given by them or eat any food. But over here, in fact, you have the disciples who have happily gone into the town to buy food from the Samaritans uh, because the disciples are not discriminating against uh, any race or any community. And in the same way here, you have Jesus very happily receiving water from this lady. So this catches her attention and she says, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. So why are you asking me for a drink? Um, and uh, Jesus, rather than touching upon that point, he comes to the point that he wishes to make. And he says, if you knew who I was, you would actually ask me for living water. And um, uh, the lady is not surprised when he uses this phrase living water, because that's a term which they were very, very familiar with in those days. It just basically meant um, water which looks alive in a sense. It's an underground spring. And then when the waters come gushing out, you know, from, from beneath the ground, um, it's, um, it looks alive because, you know, it's, it's all bubbly and very fast and quick in its flow. So they were generally called living waters. So these are, um, these are spring waters which are coming out from somewhere from beneath the ground. Uh, so this is what Jesus is referring to. And uh, uh, so he says to her, if you knew who I was, then you would actually ask me for living water. And then in reply, the lady says, uh, this is what she says in verse 11. Uh, so maybe we can look all the way up to uh, verse 15, verses 11 to 15, if someone could read out. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from in it himself, as well as his son and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that sh I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Yes. So here, um, when Jesus talks about the living water which he can give, she asks, are you greater than our father Jacob? Because for them, historically, this particular well was important. This is the well which Jacob had personally gifted to his son. And uh, so she says, our forefather Jacob, he himself drank from this well and the, and the water of this well was good enough for him. And now you are talking about a, about a spring somewhere else. So are you greater than him? Are you offering something that is better than what our forefather Jacob offered? And uh, so then Jesus say, uh, you know, indicates that, yes, what he has to offer is far superior. And so he says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Um, and uh, so the woman is kind of surprised at this. And then she says, OK, then in that case, sir, you give me that water because I don't want to get thirsty ever again. I don't want to have to come back over here to this well again and again to draw water from here. And so she takes it in a literal sense. Um, she thinks about physical water, which maybe when you drink it, you will, which uh, it will take away your thirst forever. So she's thinking in physical terms, of course. And then, in reply to that, the next verse, which uh, the next wording which Jesus speaks, would have been very harsh to her ears. Uh, so uh, yes, if we could, you know, look at those verses, maybe we can go from verse 16 all the way up to verse 20. Uh, verse 16 up to verse 20, please. Verse 16. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truth, truth truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. All right. So here we see um, the lady saying, OK, if you have the spring somewhere, 
which can give me water, which will take away my thirst completely, then I won't have this painful job of coming over here to collect water at an odd timing, uh, you know, in the middle of the day when the heat is intense. Uh, so I will be saved that task. So yes, please give me this water. And instead of replying to her, Jesus says, go call your husband. Now, this would have been a painful thing for her to hear. Um, uh, so she honestly replies, I have no husband. Now, maybe she would like Jesus to think that she's a widow uh, or something like that. And so she, she just simply says, I have no husband. But Jesus, you know, he pokes even harder and he says, yeah, the fact is true. You don't really don't have a husband because the man that you're living with right now, you are not married legally to him. And in the past, you actually had five husbands. So this is a very uh, painful issue that Jesus is bringing up, something that must uh, have caused her much shame. In fact, we, we know how pained she is and how ashamed she is of this situation because instead of coming in the coming for water in the morning, early morning, the, along with all the other women, she's coming in the heat of the day when the heat is most intense. Why? Because this topic is something that's painful, shameful for her. And now Jesus is deliberately bringing it up. Why does Jesus do that? Because Jesus said that he has got waters which can take her thirst away. He's not really that concerned about her physical thirst. He's very concerned about the thirst which is there deep inside her, which has been haunting her for so many years. We don't really know why five husbands rejected her and threw her out of their house. I mean, um, it may be that she was physically unappealing. Maybe she was not a beautiful woman. On the other hand, maybe she had a poor character. Uh, so maybe because of uh, her, her uh, behavior with other men, the husbands were upset and threw her out. So it might have been her fault. Maybe it was not her fault. We do not know. I mean, we are very quick to pass judgment on her. And then we know we say, oh, she must have been an immoral person. But here we are not told why those five men rejected her and threw her out. It may have been no fault of hers. On the other hand, yes, maybe she had a part to play because of her uh, you know, poor character and the way she was chasing after other men. Maybe because of that, the husbands threw her out. But whatever the case, being thrown out of the house back in those days would have been a very uh, traumatic uh, uh, thing to go through. Because, I mean, women were not financially self-sufficient and her family would not want to take her back after you know she's been thrown out by her husband so which means she would be helpless she would literally have to go hunting for another husband to her, for another person who would be willing to marry her and give her roof over her head and she had to go through that experience five times truly traumatic and then after five times of going through this now nobody wants to marry her nobody's interested so she's reduced to a condition now where she agrees to stay with a man even though he's not offering marriage so that she can have a roof over her head, so that she can have food in her stomach. That is the condition which she is in. So you can imagine how thirsty this lady would be, how desperate she would be for some kind of relief, for some kind of comfort. So that's the kind of person that Jesus is addressing. And that's the person whom you know the Lord saw from above, from, he from the heavens, and he urged Jesus to go and have an encounter with her. He cared about her. She was so unimportant by the stage that nobody cared about her. I mean, nobody was willing to even offer marriage to her. She was in that state where the Almighty One cared for her, cared about her thirst. And so, it is basically to quench her thirst that Jesus is bringing up this very, very painful and shameful topic. And when she, when she realizes that Jesus knows about her past, he, uh, she says, my, you must be a prophet because there's no other way you would have known about my background. And uh, so now that, now that she sees that he is a prophet, she's kind of um, you know eager. And she wants to ask something which has been on her mind for a long time because she's very aware of her Samaritan um, um, status, you know, and she's always seen how the Jewish people treat them like as if they are dirt. And so that, that's something that she's been thinking about. 
just because she has lived in the way that she has doesn't mean that she has doesn't have any any religious thoughts any spiritual thoughts in her mind she too is quite capable of thinking of such things so you know we look at people outwardly and we think ha ah, look at the world worldly way that person is living i'm sure you know they have no interest in godly things but that's not true inside every heart there are thoughts and hopes and dreams even spiritual ones so she brings up this topic now and she says i have noticed this difference your jewish people they say that we are supposed to you know that you're we are all supposed to go to jerusalem and worship over there and only that is true worship uh, on the other hand this is what we were told by our forefather that you know we should worship on gerizim uh, so um, uh, she says uh, you know which is the correct uh, version should we all go to jerusalem and worship over there or is it all right for us to worship on mount gerizim the way we have been doing is what she asks over here and then in reply to that this is what jesus says so now jesus is coming into you know he's now beginning to talk about things which will actually make a difference in her life personally this is not just some uh, sermon that he decides, decides to preach because he felt like preaching at that moment he's talking about something which is going to be a great blessing to this woman who has been thirsty her whole life this is going to be something which is going to bless her and so earlier he had told her you know i am the one who's holding the living waters when you drink of it you will never be thirsty because these waters are going to become like one spring which will literally spring out of you overflowing flowing out continually so that you will never ever be thirsty again never again will you run out of water you will always you know your thirst will always be quenched so this is that is what jesus said and now he's talking about how a person can access that kind of water and so you know keeping that context in mind if we can look at the next few verses so if someone could read out for us uh, verses 21 to 24 yes please 21 to 24 Jesus said to her Woman believe me the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the father you worship what you do do not know we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the father in his spirit and the truth for the father is speaking such to worship him God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in His spirit and truth. So Jesus says to her, "Yeah, there's been a lot of debate going on. Uh, the Jews believe that Jerusalem is the right place, and you guys believe that Jerusalem is the right place. But you know what? A day is coming when it's not really going to matter where you're going to be doing this worship, whether it's in Jerusalem or in Jerusalem uh, or some other place. What is going to really matter is what's inside of you." if you are a true worshipper you will worship in spirit and in truth those are the true worshipers they are the ones whose thirst is quenched they are the ones you see who will have this living water literally flowing out of them they will have so much water that they will never ever be thirsty again if you can become that kind of a true worshipper you know the lord is saying to this lady you your thirst will be taken care of so that is what you should be aiming for doesn't matter whether you're going to be doing your worship in jerusalem or in gerizim are you a true worshipper that is the kind of worshipper that you need to become um so uh, you know uh, what jesus has said earlier about the living waters is directly connected to what he is now saying over here about a true worshipper who worships in spirit and in truth what is his meaning by these two terms because if we can understand these two terms maybe it can go a long way in quenching our thirst as well because we have a lot of believers who have accepted the lord as uh, savior and it's a genuine commitment that they have made but they think that all that they have got from the lord is a ticket to heaven they don't realize that there is so much more that they have received from him and they are just as thirsty as the people out there it's so sad they literally have the living waters with them in them but they are so thirsty because they do not know how to access these waters 
they have not learned to worship him in spirit and in truth and so they are dry and dehydrated just like the people of the world and it's a very sad state of affairs we were never meant to be like that we were supposed to be overflowing with the living waters so that we will never be thirsty that is supposed to be the privilege which we should be walking in so let's kind of try to understand what this means first of all what is the what is the what is jesus talking about when he talks about true worshipers is a worshiper someone who lifts up their hands when they go to church on sunday and the worship time is going on it's not really talking about just singing over here when it says true worshipers it's talking about a daily everyday lifestyle where you literally are living out a worship lifestyle where every moment you are connecting with your god and savior in the spirit and in truth and when you connect with him in spirit and in truth you you literally overflow with the living waters because you are in 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 connection with the source of the living waters so how do we connect with him on a daily basis in the spirit and how do we connect with him in truth let's come to the first point in the spirit is talking about inner true connection with god because you see here the lady is asking the question which place of worship do we go to the one in jerusalem or the one sitting on mount gerizim she is talking about outward worship outward rituals are good and godly you know we we too have outward rituals like going to church that's an excellent thing to do uh, reading the bible that's another wonderful outward ritual prayer that is also an excellent godly outward ritual but just the outward ritual alone is not going to quench our thirst because while the outward ritual is being acted out something needs to happen on the inside where you in your spirit are connecting with the lord's spirit you're reaching out to him in spirit and connecting with him then something spectacular happens on the inside you start being changed and transformed the living waters are no longer blocked they just start flowing into every area of your life because now you have connected with him in the spirit it's not exactly as complicated and over spiritual as it sounds it's a simple thing to use a small to simple example when you go to church on sunday you know um and then you have the time of worship and then uh, you have the declaration uh, and then uh, you have the sermon so everyone goes over there everyone encounters the same thing the worship time the declaration time and then you have the sermon time and then there are people who go back home having attended the service but then there will be some people over there who connected with the lord in the spirit during the songs during the declaration when those words were being spoken they connected with him when the sermon was going on they were, they were they had this hungry receptive heart which was reaching out to the lord and saying i want something from you please meet me i want to have an encounter with you and they go back from the church bubbling because the living waters got you no know, a new supply of living waters got released inside so some people just attended the outward service the outer ritual was done but the, they did not connect with him in spirit nothing happened on the inside so over here jesus is differentiating between outward ritual and worshiping him in the spirit where you connect with him the hunger which you are having for him literally pulls you to him and he gives you something because you're longing for it you're asking for it you're claiming it and the lord maybe gives you some verse or some some wording in the song speaks to you and you have your encounter with the source of the waters and you go away your thirst having been quenched and satisfied it's the same with you know um, um with your time of devotions the outward ritual is very very good but is it just an outward ritual or are you connecting with him during your quiet time if that is happening then you are worshiping him in the spirit 
and something is happening in your spirit as a result of that and your thirst is quenched so um that is how a true worshipper connects with the father they connect with him in the spirit and secondly they connect with him in truth uh because even as the person meditates upon the truth which is there in the old testament and new testament scriptures they begin to discover who they are how important they are how high their status is in the lord they begin to discover the truths about who they are and they also begin to discover the truth about who he is who this yahweh is who this jesus is and they learn that he is compassionate that he is righteous he is holy and those are no longer just words to them they have personally experienced his righteousness and what it can do for them they have personally experienced his compassion and they know what that feels like so they are worshiping him also in truth they are meditating upon his word and that word is coming alive to them and they are learning to walk in the truth of who they are in him and they are walking in the truth of who he is he is this one person that you can completely trust no matter what he asks of you you can go ahead and obey like abraham even if the lord says you know sacrifice your son you can go ahead and trust him because he is that trustworthy so they begin to understand these truths and walk in them a person who's walking like this does not stay thirsty their thirst is quenched on a daily basis i am not saying that a true worshipper will not uh, face trials and difficulties oh yes apostle paul underwent so many difficulties and trials jesus in fact promises trials and difficulties he says in john 16:33 he says in this world you will have trouble take heart i have overcome the world is what the lord says and so when you go to philippians chapter 4 this is how you know apostle paul um you know practices these words the uh, which you know which jesus has taught um so if someone could read out philippians chapter 4 verses 11 to 13 you will see uh, the the example of a true worshipper here philippians 4 Eleven to thirteen. If someone could read out, please. Not Philippians four eleven to thirteen. Not that I speak in regard to need, for uh, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be as. based and i know how to abound everywhere and in all things i have learned both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need i can do all things through christ who strengthens me in these beautiful verses paul says i have learned to be content whatever the circumstances and he says that he has learned the secret of being content and what is the secret the secret is this that i can do all this through him who gives me strength so it's not that paul didn't get thirsty every single day he got thirsty every single day he faced trials and difficulties and then when he did that he would go into god's presence he would connect with the lord in the spirit and in truth and come out strong satisfied thirst quenched so he never stayed thirsty he didn't get de more and more dehydrated he would go back into god's presence every day and connect with him in spirit and in truth and come out having drunk deeply of the waters living waters so this is something which worked for him so in the same way even our thirst can be quenched on a daily basis if we can start practicing this true worship lifestyle of connecting with him in the spirit not just through outward rituals and also connecting with him in the truth learning who he is learning who we are and walking in those truths our thirst also can be quenched daily on a daily basis um so um, the woman at this point in uh, john chapter 4 uh, 
um, she has not quite understood what Jesus is saying, but then this is what she's, she replies to him. Uh, so uh, that would be verse 25 uh, and verse 26. Uh, she says, the woman said, I know that Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. So here is this woman who, you know, has been condemned by her society as someone who is immoral, who is living with a man that she's not even married to. A woman like that has actually been eagerly looking forward to the Messiah. She really doesn't know anything much about spiritual things. Her knowledge is very, very basic. But this much she knows that there's someone the Messiah who's going to come one day, he's going to be the savior of everyone, whether they're big people or small people. So she knows that she's going to be important to this Messiah, even though she's considered very, very small by her society. And so she's longing and waiting for him because when he comes, he's going to explain everything to her and even she will have a future and a hope. So then Jesus says, you know, the person that you've been waiting for so eagerly, I am he. So this lady did not know much. But whatever she little bit she knew, she was trying to act on that and live in that. And because that, of that hunger that she had, much more was given to her. And uh, that's a truth, you know, which uh, we see in Matthew chapter 13, verses 11 to 12. I think that's important that we should, you know, um, focus on that. Matthew 13, if someone could read out verses 11 and 12, please. He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Over here, it's talking about the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Those who have a little bit and who are really believing in it, walking in it, trusting it, learn, you know, they will be given more. But those who are uninterested and couldn't care less about these secrets of the kingdom, what little bit they still they have with them, Satan will come and take away even that and they'll be left with nothing. This is a spiritual truth. This woman who was living in circumstances which made, made, made society look down upon her, that little bit which she had, she was guarding it. She was waiting for this Messiah to come and explain things to them because she wanted to worship in the right way. She wanted to know the correct way to do things. She had a spiritual longing in her. And because she had that, more, much more was given to her. On the other hand, if she had been a person uninterested in the things of God, in the secrets of the kingdom, even the little which, uh, which she had, she would have lost along the way. And that applies to believers today. You know, there are those who have a hunger in them to grow in God, to know more. And this is the promise which the Lord himself is giving over here. He says, if you have a little and you are really holding on to it and you have a longing for, to increase, an abundance will be given to you. But those who are uninterested, they will lose even what they have. So having just focused on those uh, few uh, highlights, uh, we can move into the next chapter, chapter 5. And here we have the story of the uh, paralytic at the pool of Bethesda. Uh, so maybe we could just look at the first four verses and then look at the background and then plunge into the story. Uh, so if, if you could read out just the first four verses, please. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In this lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had 
Okay. So, um, if you have been following along in an NIV Bible or some other um, newer version, you will not find verse 4 in your Bible. It will only be there in the footnotes. Uh, you will only have verses 1 to 3. That whole thing about the angel coming and stirring up the waters will not be mentioned over there um, in the newer versions. So let's deal with that first before we get into the actual um, you know, passage. Um, NIV and some of the newer versions uh, do not mention certain verses. They don't mention certain passages. And there's a reason for it. Um, when um, in 383 AD, very, very long ago, when uh, Jerome first uh, translated the Bible into the Latin language, he used whatever um, original documents he could find. And using those, he tried to do his translation most sincerely. So he, he whatever you know, handwritten copies which were still existing at that time, he used those most ancient manuscripts for his translation work because he wanted to be as accurate as possible. And then later in 1611, when the KJV version was um, translated, uh, the KJV team basically relied a lot upon the Latin Vulgate translation, which had been done earlier. Um, and uh, they also used the manuscripts uh, which um, Jerome had used. So those manuscripts, you know, those handwritten copies which had come down, uh, they are basically uh, called Byzantine manuscripts. And they are copies which were hand copied during the 12th century. Uh, so, you know, around in the 1100s is basically when people would have uh, copied by hand um, those, you know, those verses and Bible passages from older documents. So, they, so those copies which we have in our hands called the Byzantine manuscripts, they are from around the 12th century AD, which basically means that these handwritten copies were created um, 12 centuries after the resurrection of Jesus. But then something happened in the early 1900s, or maybe it was in the mid-1900s. I'm not particularly sure, but sometime in the 1900s is when people discovered very, very ancient manuscripts, which are much more older than these Byzantine manuscripts. And they came to be called the Alexandrian manuscripts. These Alexandrian handwritten copies are literally from the 5th century, just five centuries after the resurrection of Jesus. So they are more ancient. And chances are that they have been less tampered with uh, because as time went by, you know, the writers who are hand copying the, the documents probably would have added some explanations in the margin just to make things a little more clear for the readers. So somewhere along the way, the additional notes which they have added in the margins came into the scripture itself and things got added to the scripture along the way, which is why when you look, when you compare the Alexandrian manuscripts and the Byzantine manuscripts, you'll find a whole bunch of extra stuff in the Byzantine manuscripts, which are not there in the Alexandrian manuscripts. Um, I don't really remember the uh, how many extra words there are. Some number of uh, extra words are to be found in the Byzantine manuscripts. So basically what NIV and some of the newer versions did is they, they, they decided that when they would do their translation, rather than depending on the 12th century manuscripts, they decided that they would use the 5th century manuscripts because they assumed that that would be more original and more untouched. And so they used those to do their translation work. So whenever they come across these you know, portions which are there in the Byzantine manuscript, and which are not there in the Alexandrian manuscript, they just put that in the footnotes. But they don't include it in the main uh, scripture passage. So that's basically the difference. So maybe at some point of time, someone wanted to explain why you have a whole bunch of sick people you know, lying near the pool of Bethesda. The people generally, sick people generally gathered over there because of this legend 
you know, which was existing in those days, that on certain days, an angel would come and stir up the waters. Don't know whether it actually such a thing ever happened or not, but at least that was the belief. And so in the hope that, that the angel would come and stir the water so that they can go and, you know, jump into the waters and be healed with that hope, people would gather in that uh, particular place um, where you have five porches. Uh, so when Jesus comes to this person, um, this is what Jesus says. Uh, maybe we can actually look at those verses. Uh, so if someone could read out for us all the way from verse 5 up to verse 9. John chapter 5, verses 5 to 9. Yeah, verse 5. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. and But while I am coming... Another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Yeah. If you look at verse 6, it says, When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, Jesus approaches him. And Jesus speaks to him. So you have this uh, colonnade um, where you have so many sick people gathered. And Jesus sidesteps all of them and walks up to this one person. Why did Jesus, Jesus choose this particular man? Why didn't Jesus walk up to somebody else and heal them? Uh, and uh, so in verse 6 it says, Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time. That made Jesus walk up to this particular person. Also, Jesus must have seen something else about him, details about him in the spirit. In the same way, Jesus knew details about the Samaritan woman, you know, things which had not been revealed. Jesus knew about her background. In the same way, Jesus learned uh, something in his spirit about this man's background. Uh, so, he comes to this man. Later on, we get to know what the background is. Um, in uh, verse 14, Jesus goes to him and says, Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. So here is a man who had done something really terrible, which opened up you know, his life to the evil spirits who could come and take such a strong hold of him that they kept him in that paralyzed condition for 38 years. I mean, I don't know what terrible sin the man committed, you know, for uh, the demons to be able to take advantage of him in this manner. Um, I mean, we have absolutely no idea. But that is what Jesus saw. Among all the people lying over there, he looked around and he found the most rotten character among all of them. And Jesus walks up to that man and decides to show him mercy. We see this again and again in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. You know, The weakest, the ones who are most undeserving, they are the ones whom Yahweh picks. You know, If you notice, that's always the case. Israel, I mean, there were so many nations at that time. Israel was a weak and puny nation compared to the other powerful nations. They hardly had any status. They were, in fact, a bunch of slaves, you know, uh, when uh, when the Lord comes to them. By now, they have forgotten their father, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now they're just a bunch of slaves, and they're worshipping idols in, uh, in Egypt. They're in that condition, and God chooses that bunch of people to enter into a covenant with. In the same way, David, I mean, uh, that David's dad had a whole bunch of very um, refined, accomplished sons. God doesn't choose any of them. He chooses the guy who has been dismissed to the woods as a shepherd because, you know, uh, they can't find anything better for him to do. And so they put him over there with the sheep. God chooses him. Uh, it's the same with the fishermen whom Jesus chooses as his, as his elite inner circle. The unlearned fishermen, they are the ones who he chooses. 
so god always looks for the worst because he wants to restore even the worst which is why you know when um, in uh, mark chapter 2 uh, the pharisees when they see jesus eating with the tax collectors and the sinners they say ha look 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 at the kind of people that he interacts with and this is what jesus says when they when the past comment on him about the kind of people that he's interacting with in mark chapter 2 verse 17 jesus says it is not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick i have come uh, not to call the righteous but sinners is what it says so um jesus was always looking out for those who are who don't deserve any mercy and he splurges his love and mercy on such people if they are willing to repent if they are open to what he has to offer and so jesus walks up to the worst person over there and you know the people over there would have known a little bit about this man's background because they have nothing else to do over there right they're lying over there sick so there would be, there would be a lot of gossip going on on a daily basis so people would say to each other you know that guy over there 38 years he's been lying over there wonder what sin he committed to you know come to this state so people would have exchanged gossip about him about his background so people would have known and jesus walks up to this man and he says do you want to get well and the poor man he says i have no one to help me into the pool so when the pool waters start moving somebody else goes in i never get a chance and Jesus doesn't say, oh, poor you, next time the waters, you know, stir, I will help you. No. Jesus says, get up, pick up your mat. It's like Jesus is saying, doesn't matter whether if nobody's there to help you, I am there, no, more than enough. I mean, uh, those are beautiful words. If you're in a position where you're saying to yourself, I have no one to help me, no props. Jesus is saying, I'm there, no. Pick up your mat, walk. I can make it happen for you. So he is the one who will reach out to the most hopeless cases because he is their doctor if, if a person is saying i'm beyond help nothing more can be done for me i have no future left i am one failure i'm one waste case if you're saying that to yourself you know jesus comes to you and he says no problem get up i'm going to help you get, get you know get you back onto your feet so we can have that hope now, does this mean that Jesus is discriminating against the, all the others at the pool? Is it their fault that they are not rotten people like this man? No. You see, Jesus was setting a, an example. By going to the worst case, Jesus was basically saying to all the people over there, if this man can be saved by God, imagine how much more easily the Lord can do that for all of you. It would have built up the hope of all the others big time. They would have told themselves, if, if such a person like this can be helped by God, definitely I can be helped by God. It would have built up their way, hope and their faith. Let's come back to this after the, after the break. We'll continue after the break. Thank you. <laughs> 